Okay, hello and welcome to the next lecture part on uh, the k nearest neighbor method for classification. So we've already seen how um, k and n works for regression, k and n for classification works in a super similar manner. So I'll keep this um, quite short and on point. So um, how does k and n again work? What was the general principle behind k nearest neighbors? So for each point to predict at test time in our test data, we compute the k nearest neighbors in our training data and we put them in a set. So nk of x is the set of the k nearest neighbors for this guy x here. And then in order to form prediction for x, we just average the output y um, over all of these k neighbors. And in regression, this was particularly simple because these outputs here in uh, nk of x, they are all just a numerical score, right? So usually we just really average them over this um, over this set nk of x. Um, for classification, this is just a tiny bit more difficult because um, all of these k neighbors here have discrete class labels and we can't average so easily over them. So we'll just either um, form a discrete predicted class label by doing um, majority voting. So we just peek into the set of k nearest neighbors and we figure out which class actually occurs the most often among these k nearest neighbors. And mathematically, you can write this down um, like this, uh, which is just a fancy way of um, specifying what I just intuitively explained. So we iterate over all um, k neighbors, and then we just compute through this indicator function here, whether, um, yeah, uh, whether the uh, neighbor has label L, and then we sum over all neighbors. And then, the, so we have now constructed a simple count measure, yeah, how often label L occurs in the um, set of nearest neighbors. And then we just pick the label yeah, with the um, maximal number of counts. And we can also construct posterior probabilities in a similar manner. So if we want to talk about what is the posterior probability of object X being from class L, we just peek into the set of K nearest neighbors and we compute the, uh, the frequency, um, the percentage number of nearest neighbors having class label L. Um, here's an example. So maybe that makes a bit more sense. Um, if you can see a concrete computation for this. So this is um, a 2D slice of our well-known iris data set. Um, we use the k nearest neighbor algorithm by considering um, three nearest neighbors for each point at prediction time. And um, maybe our candidate point x nu lies here. We now compute the three nearest neighbors of x nu. Um, and this would then be our data matrix from the iris data sets. Um, we can see here um, the, the SEPA length coordinate. So this guy, we can see the SEPA width coordinate. So this guy, um, we see the um, target label in our training data set. And um, we have also computed the distances of all training data um, observations to this guy x new here. And conveniently, we have also marked the um, three training data observations with minimal distance to x new, which is this guy, this guy, and this guy, which all have a distance of 0.1 to x new. And as you can now see, there is um, zero occurrences of um, class etosa in these three nearest neighbors. So our estimated posterior probability for 
Setosa for point x nu would be zero. We have one object of class Versi color. So posterior probability would be one third. And we have two occurrences of class Virginica. So posterior probability is two thirds. And if you want to would now pick a um, discrete class assignment for x nu, this is probably going to be Virginica, right? Because Virginica has the highest posterior probability. Um, so this is a simple way to estimate in a non-parametric fashion these posterior probabilities. I guess we can also all agree that um, these um, posterior probability assignments on computations are going to be um, quite unreliable if k is very small. Uh, if you only have a couple of neighbors um, and maybe quite, a, quite many classes, uh, these computations are not going to be um, super smooth and reliable and but for larger case uh, and larger local areas uh, this might work quite quite well um, this effect you can also see here visually um, so again i have considered here this uh, 2d slice um, of the iris data set and i have now uh, colorized the decision regions and decision boundaries for a K and an algorithm where I vary K from a very small value of K equals one to larger values. Uh, so to K equals five, K equals 10 and K equals 50. And what you can see here is that the smaller I set K um, for my K and N classifier, the more complex, wiggly and rough my decision boundaries are and the more I can actually model quite local structures and the larger I make k the more global my um, model becomes the smoother these decision boundaries become. Uh, so I have much less flexibility if I make k um, a lot larger I have much more flexibility if I pick a small k. On the other hand, I have also um, increased now a lot my chances of overfitting on um, um, on data sets, uh, especially in higher dimensions with a low number of observations if I pick k too small. Um, so k is a yeah, kind of super um, typical instance of a complexity control hyperparameter for a machine learning model. And yeah, during hyperparameter tuning, um, we will later learn also how to pick such a parameter automatically. Here I mainly want to visualize and explain the effect that this parameter has on training and the resulting classification model. Um, Maybe some final uh, words on why K and N is also usually considered a um, so-called non-parametric model and what actually happens during training of a K and N algorithm. So K and N we also call a lazy classifier. So it has no real training step because it doesn't really do anything. It does one thing though. It simply stores the complete training data and it has to do that because during prediction time, right, I have to be able to do these nearest neighbor computations. So I need to have um, all of the training data in memory. Hence, the parameters of my k nearest neighbor model are actually all feature values of all of my training data. So there is absolutely no compression or aggregation of information going on. Um, what you can also see is that the numbers, number of parameters of my k and n model are actually growing if I just increase the number of my uh, training points. So if I'm staying in the same scenario, I'm just using 1000 training data points instead of uh, 100, the number of parameters actually grows. This would not happen, for example, in a linear model. So in the same scenario, if uh, whether I take, as long as I don't change the scenario, and if I don't change um, the features that I'm using, it doesn't really matter whether I take 100 500, 1000 or a million training data points, the dimensionality of my linear model and the uh, number of uh, estimated parameters always stays the same. And this is why I call a linear model um, a parametric model and why I call a K and N model a, a non-parametric model. That's actually the defining property of a non-parametric model that the number of parameters is allowed to um, 
increase if I increase um, my the size of my training data set. Um, and because of this non-parametric property, also because KNN is not based on any distributional or strong functional assumption, it can, in theory, model data situations of arbitrary complexity.